Hamilton is a phenomenon. I mean, I don't think I need to explain what Hamilton is, but in case you don't know, Hamilton is a musical about one of America's founding fathers, Alexander Hamilton. The musical follows the story of Hamilton, how he joins the revolution, rises in the political ranks, starts his own family, makes enemies along the way, and eventually is killed in a duel against Aaron Burr. The musical was written by Lin-Manuel Miranda and came on to Broadway in 2015. Lin took six years to write this musical and clearly did a lot of research into the history of Hamilton. But of course, he also took a lot of artistic liberty in altering Hamilton's story to be more interesting for the modern audience. So in this video, let's analyze how historically accurate is the musical Hamilton? As I mentioned in my historical review of the musical 1776, another musical about a founding father, which you should totally check out, I am not an expert in musicals, nor am I an expert in US history, but I know how to Google, so let's get started. Act one, song one, Alexander Hamilton. How does a bastard, orphan, son of a whore and a Scotsman dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean by providence impoverished and squalor grow up to be a hero and a scholar so the first song, Alexander Hamilton, is our introduction to the main character. The song is an exposition song of how Hamilton ended up in America. Alexander Hamilton was born on the Caribbean island of Nevis, the second bastard son born between his father, James Hamilton, and mother, Rachel Fawcett. Hamilton's mother is referenced as a whore a number of times in the musical, including in this striking opening line. And, well, yeah. <laughs> She did go to jail for adultery, this is even before Hamilton was born. Alex's mother Rachel was married to Jean Lavigne, but Rachel was caught having an affair, so her husband sent her to jail. He had her released a few months later, but rather than returning to her husband, she escaped the island and met James Hamilton. Although she was still technically married to Lavigne, she started to live with James and had a kid with him the kid being Alexander. Lavigne finally divorced her and you think maybe Rachel can remarry James and have a normal life, but when he was 10, his father split full of it, debt ridden two years later, see Alex and his mother bedridden, half dead, sitting in their own sick, the scent thick, and Alex got better, but his mother went quick. Yeah, when Alex was 10, James left, and three years later, Rachel died, leaving Alex and his brother to be orphans. Now, I just told you that Hamilton was 10 years old when James left them in 1765, meaning he was born in 1755. This is what the official records state. However, his entire life, Alexander Hamilton claimed that he was born in 1757, making himself two years younger. Historians think that this was a purposeful decision made when he was very young. By the time he was an orphan at the age of 13, that was kind of considered a bit too old to be accepted as an apprentice to any business. By making himself two years younger, it may have been easier for Hamilton to find an apprenticeship. And he did. He ended up working at an importation firm, and he actually did so well that he was put in charge of a big chunk of the business. He was clearly more intelligent than an average teenager. Well, the word got around, they said this kid is insane, man. Took a book collection just to send him to the mainland. Get your education, don't forget from whence you came. His mother's sister, who was taking care of Hamilton after he became orphaned, recognized Hamilton's potential and saved money to send Hamilton to America. A local minister also got involved in this effort and asked for donations from people around the island to send Alexander Hamilton to America. And in 1772, Alex is off to New York. Song 2, Aaron Burser. 1776 New York City Pardon me, are you Aaron Burr, sir? This song describes the moment Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr first meet. This is quite an important song considering that Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr are pretty much the two main characters of this musical. But this event is fictional, 
We don't have any records of Burr and Hamilton's first meeting. We don't know when or where it might have happened and no idea what their first impressions of each other were. I kind of disagree with the idea that their first meeting would have been in 1776. And with the narrative of the story, I think it would make more sense if their first meeting would have happened in maybe 1772. In the song, Alex knows about Burr, but Burr doesn't know about him. This would make sense for Alex, who just arrived in America and doesn't have any sort of reputation versus Burr, who came from a very prominent family, would probably have been on Hamilton's radar. 1772 is also the year Alex was seeking admission to Princeton University. I heard your name at Princeton. I was seeking an accelerated course of study. When I got sort of out of sorts with a buddy of yours, I may have punched him. It's a blur, sir. He handles the financials. You punched the Burr, sir. Yes. So punching the bursar thing didn't happen. Lynn said that this line was just too good of a joke and a good rhyme to not put in the musical. Hamilton did have an argument with the college's president, John Witherspoon. According to letters by Hercules Mulligan, Hamilton was accepted to Princeton, but his decision was later revoked. And this was because Hamilton expressed desire to complete his degree in less than four years. So Hamilton asking Burr how he successfully managed to graduate way early makes sense timing-wise if the scene took place in 1772. And it's true that Burr, as well as other founding fathers like James Madison, also did an accelerated study at Princeton. Wait, so why couldn't Hamilton? So there are actually rumors that Hamilton's acceptance was revoked because of his illegitimate origins. Ben Franklin's illegitimate son was also known to be disliked by Witherspoon for the same reason, so this is probably a legit argument. Anyways, after being rejected by Princeton, Hamilton ends up attending King's College in New York, today known as Columbia University. But after two years, he actually withdrew. He really wanted to join the revolution and fight. Anyways, besides the shift in timeline, I think this song does a good job of setting up this fictional first meeting. And it immediately shows us how Burr and Hamilton are very different people. Hamilton is excited and passionate whilst Burr is calm and more calculating. He gives Hamilton some advice. Talk less. What? Smile more. Huh. Don't let them know what you're against or what you're for. This advice doesn't sit well with Hamilton. We see that this friendship probably isn't going to work out when these three show up. Uh, yeah, yo, yeah, yo, yo, what time is it? Showtime! Lawrence, Lafayette, and Mulligan are set up in the musical to become Hamilton's true buddies. I love the chemistry these guys have on stage, and I think many people who watch Hamilton really enjoy their dynamic. But were these four actually a squad in real life? Hercules Mulligan and Alexander Hamilton actually first meet in 1773, and they end up becoming roommates while Hamilton is studying at King's College. But Mulligan was 15 years older than Hamilton, so, so he ended up kind of serving the role of Hamilton's American dad. Mulligan would show him around town and introduce him to new people, and is probably the person responsible for introducing Hamilton to the concept of an American revolution. Hamilton originally supported British rule, but after living with Mulligan and learning from him, he ended up developing pro-patriot views, and pretty quickly Hamilton ended up joining the Sons of Liberty. Mulligan was influential in Hamilton's life, but he was more of a mentor figure, not necessarily a buddy. On the other hand, Hamilton, Lafayette, and Lawrence's relationship was more of a conventional friendship. The three of them were close in age and met during the war. With heightened emotions of potentially getting killed at any moment, they formed a very deep attachment to one another. There have been many rumors about the true nature of their relationship, some saying that these three were more than just friends. One of Alexander Hamilton's grandsons called these three the gay trio. However, within the trio, Hamilton and Lawrence's relationship particularly stands out. The way they wrote to one another is very endearing and seemingly flirtatious. Writing etiquette back in the 1700s was much more frou-frou than it is today, 
And with the fear that any letter might be your last letter, maybe it's expected for Hamilton to write. I wish, my dear Lawrence, it might be in my power by action rather than words to convince you that I love you. I know there was a lot crammed into Hamilton, but it would have been really fun to explore this dynamic. Even historians that take a more cautious approach to labeling Hamilton and Lawrence's relationship admit that Hamilton must have had a crush on Lawrence, whether platonic or romantic. Anyway, speaking of Lawrence, he was an ardent abolitionist, and this is mentioned in the next song in the musical, My Shot. And but we'll never be truly free until those in bondage have the same rights as you and me. Right. You and I do or die. Ooh. Wait till I sally in on a stallion with the first black battalion have another shot. Lawrence was from South Carolina and actually came from a family that owned many slaves. But he refused to inherit his family's slaves and pushed George Washington to allow slaves to fight in the revolution and promise their freedom in return for their service. Hamilton was also an abolitionist, but... Eh. Hamilton said slavery was bad and he himself did not own any slaves, but in reality, he helped his father-in-law purchase slaves and in general wasn't hugely vocal about this particular issue. So I kind of think that it is a little bit misleading that the musical seems to suggest that Hamilton was much more of a vocal activist uh, against slavery than he actually was. Anyways, back to the musical, Mulligan is aged down a little bit and joins the gay trio to form a cute little group. In reality, Mulligan probably never met Lafayette or Lawrence, but I'm not mad about the fact that this squad is historically inaccurate. I think the four of them are awesome. We then move on to meet some new characters. Uh oh, but little does he know that his daughter's Peggy, Angelica, Eliza, sneak into the city just to watch all the guys. It work, work. Angelica, work, work. Eliza, and Peggy, work, work. the stylist. Angelica, Peggy, Eliza. Work. So the Schuyler family lived in Albany. That's 150 miles away from Manhattan. For Peggy, Angelica, and Eliza to sneak into Manhattan, that probably wouldn't have made any sense. It would have taken maybe three or four days by a horse and carriage to get from Albany to Manhattan. Anyways, in the song, the sisters sing about how amazing it is to be living through a revolutionary time in history and how the girls are out looking for a suitable intellectual man. But by 1776, Angelica had already met the man she will marry. John Barker Church was a British-born merchant and Angelica met him when he was invited as a guest to the Schuyler household. And it seems like the two of them had a bond pretty immediately. They courted for a while, but Angelica's father was suspicious of church. So Angelica actually just decided to elope. <laughs> So in 1777, she pretty much just got hitched Vegas style. So yeah, I mean, Angelica might have been looking for a boyfriend, but she already had someone locked down at this point. Another interesting line in this Skylar sister song is, We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And when I meet Thomas Jefferson, oh. I'ma compel him to include women in the sequel. Work! It's funny because Angelica will meet Thomas Jefferson in the future when her and her husband moved to Paris in the 80s. This is when Jefferson was serving as America's minister to France. Angelica and Jefferson became very good friends and you could read their letters to each other to be pretty flirtatious. Anyways, this is a great song. A lot of stories set in the American Revolution don't feature a lot of women. And when there are women in the story, it's usually a founding father's wife. You don't really see women Women interacting with one another. So it's really cool to see this sisterly bond in this play. Anyways, let's move on to the next song. My name is Samuel Seabury, and I present free thoughts on the proceedings of the Continental Congress. Heed not the rabble who scream revolution. They have not your interest at heart. Oh my God, tear this dude apart. Seabury was an American bishop and a loyalist. He wrote the free thoughts on the proceedings of the Continental Congress in 1774. So again, this whole timeline is messed up. In this song, Seabury's made to sound very old fashioned and frou frou, but in reality, I think his writing is pretty strong and straightforward. The musical probably wanted the old-fashioned style to contrast Hamilton's rapping. And this little banter slash exchange mirrors the fact that Hamilton in reality also responded to Seabury in an open letter. Anyways, I don't think there's anything wrong with what's said in the song. Clearly, it's an oversimplification of both Hamilton and Seabury's writing. But, yeah, you know. 
It's a very short song, so can't help that. What's more interesting about this song is the fact that there are two contrasting musical styles. He'd have, have you all rap. unravel at the sound of scream. screams, but the revolution's coming. They have not a good old interest at it's hard to listen to you with a straight face. Seabury sings a more traditional, I guess, musical type song whilst Hamilton raps. And it's clear that Hamilton's able to get in way more words than Seabury. And so to me, what's fascinating about this song isn't necessarily the historical context, but it shows the strength in choosing rap as the medium for this particular musical. Anyways, let's move on to the next song, which I think is one of the funniest songs in the musical. You'll be back soon, you'll see. You remember you belong to me. King George III was the British monarch during the American Revolution. By this point, British monarchs had already given up majority of control to Parliament. They honestly had no real responsibilities. So although many American revolutionaries blamed the king for many of the problems in the colonies, it was really the British ministers who were to blame. George inherited the throne at the age of 22 and was actually really unprepared, so his inexperience did cause some internal drama amongst the ministers, which did contribute to the bigger drama in the American Revolution. I like King George's appearance in the musical. I think it's a bit of a palate cleanser. It takes you out of the immediate story and gives you a bit of a break before moving on to the next scene. In this next song, we get to meet another George. Here comes the General to Washington. We are outgunned, outmanned, outnumbered, outplanned. Yup, this is all true. If you've seen my videos on 1776, you know that on top of being outnumbered, Americans were struggling to secure gunpowder and other military necessities during the revolution, since many of these items could only be acquired through trade with England. This song takes place during the Battle of Long Island, also known as the Battle of Brooklyn or Battle of Brooklyn Heights. This happened in August of 1776, so finally we are in the right time frame. This battle was a total fail, and the British took New York with the Continental Army retreating into New Jersey. So the overall vibe of this song, of a desperate situation and a losing battle, is super accurate. There is a line in the song where Mulligan and Hamilton steal British cannons. Let's take a stand with the stamina and the God is granted. This Hamilton won't abandon the ship, yo, let's steal the cannons. This actually happened, but not during the Battle of Long Island. In 1775, there was a Royal Navy warship stationed in New York. At this point, Hamilton had already quit college to form his own militia. So Alex, Mulligan, and other members of the militia snuck onto the British warship in the middle of the night and stole their cannons. So again, although the timeline is wrong, at least this is something that actually happened. So anyways, the song moves on to Aaron Burr asking if he could serve under Washington, but Washington dismisses him. In reality, Burr did join Washington's staff, but left after a few weeks because the two of them apparently did not get along very well. And Hamilton was invited by many different generals to join their staff, but declined all of them. He wanted to be on the battlefield. He didn't want to be behind a desk just writing. However, when George Washington approached him in 1777, Hamilton accepted. I mean, it's George. You can't say no to George. I gotta say, I love this version of George Washington, but in reality, Washington was a very soft-spoken man. He actually suffered a lung disease as a child, so his voice was a high, weak, and breathy voice. But yeah, I'm happy for this version of George to have this deep, beautiful voice. Next song, A Winter's Ball. 1780, A Winter's Ball, and the Skylar sisters are the envy of all. Yo, if you could marry a sister, you which son? Is it a question of if Burr or which one? This song takes place in 1780. This is the year Eliza and Hamilton first meet. This song sets up a few things. First, that Burr and Hamilton are both players. Well, maybe not players. They were both very popular with the ladies. We also learn that it's advantageous to marry one of the Schuyler sisters. And it's true that the Schuyler family was socially upper class and economically very wealthy. And actually in reality, there would have been five daughters to choose from. And Philip Schuyler had 
three sons. But in the musical, there are only three daughters, just to simplify the plot a little bit more. And there really was a ball in 1780. The winter of 79 and 80 was known as a very harsh winter, and the Continental Army ended up camping out in New Jersey. The Schuyler family had relatives in New Jersey, and so the Schuyler sisters were staying with them to serve as moral support and entertainment for the soldiers. And the generals hosted a number of balls to keep the morale high. The Schuyler sisters attended these balls, and this is probably where Eliza and Alexander got to know each other. In the song, Eliza has an immediate crush on Alexander, and after the ball, they write to each other constantly, and this is true. They did exchange letters almost every day after the ball. In April of 1780, Alexander asked for Eliza's hand. Philip Schuyler was apparently pretty pleased about this because two of his daughters had already gotten eloped, meaning they got married without his permission. <laughs> But anyways, Lucky Hamilton was accepted into the Schuyler family and was liked by everybody. With a cheeky line from Angelica. At my sister cause she wants to form a harem. I'm just saying, if you really love me, you would share them. Ha! This line was inspired by a real quote. Angelica wrote to Eliza, If you were as generous as the old Romans, you would lend him to me for a little while. <laughs> We then move on to the next song, and Hamilton and Eliza are getting married. This happens in December of 1780. The maid of honor, Angelica, speaks, and during the speech, everything rewinds, so we get to see Angelica's perspective on what happened during the Winter's Ball. And we learn that Angelica had a crush on Hamilton. A seemingly mutual crush, but... Angelica decided not to pursue Alexander since he is not from a high class or was very wealthy. Another reminder that at this point in the story, Angelica was already married. This doesn't mean she can't have a crush on someone, but she wasn't out there looking for a partner. Also in the musical, she states that she must marry somebody of a higher class and of good wealth because she's the eldest daughter and her father has no sons. I'm a girl in a world in which my only job is to marry rich. My father has no sons, so I'm the one who has to social climb the one. This is again false because as we discussed, she had three brothers. So this whole premise is wrong? But, 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 there definitely were rumors of Angelica and Hamilton liking each other. They definitely were good friends and wrote frequently and affectionately. But I mean, logistically, it's pretty unrealistic that they would have had a physical affair. Angelica spent like 17 years in Europe. It's impossible to tell whether the affectionate words shared over letters reflected Angelica and Hamilton's romantic feelings for one another, or if it was familial affection. But clearly Lynn decided to interpret it as romantic, and it definitely adds some spiciness to the musical. Anyways, the song ends with Angelica feeling bittersweet about Eliza and Hamilton's wedding. We then get an awesome rendition of a song we've already heard, The Story of Tonight. With a glass to freedom. Hey! Something you will never see again No matter what she tells you Let's have another round tonight Lafayette, Lawrence, Mulligan, and Hamilton are drinking after the wedding. The lyrics to this beautiful song about revolution is changed into a comedic song of Hamilton never experiencing freedom again after getting married. I think this is super clever and funny and just a cute bro moment between the four of them. This is when Aaron Burr shows up. Lauren starts to tease Burr that he's heard rumors Burr's been dating someone, and Burr confesses to Hamilton that She's married. I see. She's married to a British officer. Oh, shit. We'll get to learn more about Burr's love life in the next song, but that'll have to be in next week's video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video, and please consider checking out my review of the musical 1776. If you like Hamilton, you are sure to like 1776.